This is Officer Jared Robinette. Robinette responded to a call on March 18, 2018 of a man going down a street and breaking into cars. When Robinette and Officer Terrence McCattle arrived on the scene, they were directed by a witness to follow a man who was jumping over fences to get away. All right. Um, few formalities. Yeah. Uh, I'm Detective Griggs, G R I G G S. You are Jared Robinette. Am I Robinette. 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 I'm sorry. It's R O B I N E T. And I forgot your name, sir. I'm sorry. East Tate, Counsel for the Officer. Okay. Um, I'm staggering off him. Yes. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea kind of how I want to do things. Uh, there's some technical stuff I want to ask you about your uh, career, your chef, you know, stuff like that ahead of time. Um, then we'll talk about the day, your shift today, um, and then um, I'll probably just open it up to you, just like you'd write your observations, kind of tell me what happened, and I might have some questions, um, and we'll kind of go through it like that, okay? Okay. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, okay? Um, how long have you been with SAC PD? I've been with SAC PD for a little over four years. Four years. Uh, are you lateral, or did you go through our academy? Uh, I went through the academy, but I came from a federal law enforcement agency. Oh, okay. Where, who's that? I was at the Border Patrol. Okay. How long were you with the Border Patrol? Five years. Okay. Um, our academy, do you remember which number it was? With uh, 14 BR1. 14 BR1. And for Border Patrol, uh, is there an academy or is there... Yeah, there's an academy. Which one was that? Do you remember? Um, it's through FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Okay. And class number 910. 910. Um, and that was about, you were with them for about five years? Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you do for the Border Patrol? I was a patrol agent. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I just don't know anything about the Border Patrol. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want me to go in the primary duties? or? Is it just typical law enforcement on the border? Or? It's typical law enforcement duties as far as the Border Patrol is concerned. <laughs> okay, got you. The Border Patrol is not typical. Okay. Um, and most of it was mountainous terrain where we answered sensors and tracked groups of individuals, drugs, bandits. Okay, I guess what I need to know is are you, were you sworn law enforcement? Sworn federal law enforcement. You carry a gun? Yes. Okay. Um, and then as far as with SAC PD, you have specialized training? Are you, you know, a, a range master, or SWAT team, something like that? No, nothing like that. A field training officer? Or no. Okay. Um, what, are, what are you, What's your normal assignment? Um, Sector 5, regular swings patrol. Okay. Uh, who's your sergeant? Sergeant Bullard. Okay. Um, so this was a regular work day for you? Yes. What are your days off? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, swing shift. Does that start at 2.30 now? Yeah, 14.30. Okay. Um, yesterday, I can't remember what day it is. It's Sunday. It's Monday now. Did you work normal shift the day before? Saturday. Night. Saturday. Yes. No overtime. Uh, no, no overtime. Did you like a double shift or anything? No, like that just so no Sunday was a normal shift for you. Okay. Uh, what was your identifier? Uh, one Charles fifty four. Uh, and that means your solo car, right? Mm -hmm. Solo officer. Um, and you're dressed just like you're dressed now. Yes, sir. Could you stand up for me and kind of just show me? Uh, so regular duty uniform and um, regular duty uniform. Let's just go around your belt as far as force options. What do you have on your belt? Um, I have a couple knives. Okay. That's just the uh, in case okay. baton for less than lethal. Right. Same with the taser. Okay. Um, the pistol, you know, duty weapon, and as far as use of force options. Uh, oh, an OC right here. Okay, cool. I forget about that because I never use it. <laughs> so. uh, thank you. Um, okay. For your shift today, anything unusual happened before? Uh, obviously, the call we're going to talk about, but uh, any crazy calls? Um, no, the, major call? the majority of today, I was. Uh, Hospital watch on a prisoner from day shift. Okay. Do you remember what time or about when you stopped being hospital watch? Mm -hmm. 
you know, no. like as a Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. It wasn't, I know I, I transported to jail and it was starting to get dark. Okay, cool. Um, all right, the call on uh, 29th Street, do you remember how it came in? It came in, well, initially dispatch called a 927, suspicious subject or circumstances, and quickly changed it to a 921 with a car clout. Okay. Uh, they stated that an individual was breaking windows and vehicles along 29th Street. Okay. Let's compare the 911 call to Robinette's statement. Starting date, Sunday, March 18, 2018, 21 hours, 10 minutes, 14 seconds. 911, what's location of the emergency? Uh, 29th Street. 29th Street, thank you. Hi, what's going on there? The uh, guy's going down the street breaking windows of cars. He busted both my truck windows out. He busted in the people's backyard right now uh, across the street from my place. He busted two of my windows out and he broke the car's window out across the street from me. Okay. He's in, in people's backyard right now. Do you know which yard he's in, what the address is? Oh, I can't see the address on the house. The lights are off. Which? The lights are in the house are on. What? So it's the house he's in, the backyard he's in. This is the backyard he's in? Yep, in 29th Street. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Okay. What did he use to break the windows? I have no idea. I came out and I, I heard the noise. I came outside and he was standing right along the side of my truck and I grabbed my ball bat. I was going to, you know what I mean? But I, I didn't hit him or nothing like that. He's in the okay. backyard right here right now. He's still back. He's trying to get over the fence. He, 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 he can't go anywhere else. His dogs are all the way around him right now. Okay. What, is he black, white, Santa occasion? He had a hoodie on. I couldn't tell, ma'am. Uh, what color hoodie? It's black. He's black hoodie, and it looks like he has some kind of uh, pants on, but they have, had, they have like white stripes or white dots on them or something like that. You know what I mean? It's, okay. It's, it's not blue jeans or anything like that. They're like, I don't know. they got different colors on them. Okay. Hang tight with me for one second here. I'm just getting the... Not a problem. Yeah, he's still in the backyard back there. I can hear him looking over the fence. I hear him jiggling on the fence, trying to get looking, trying to get over that thing. And this is the corner of 29th and Twilight, right? Pretty close. Yes. Okay. No, it's close. It's close. A few houses down from that. Yes. Okay. And what's your name, sir? My name is. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you mind staying on the phone with me until we get officers there, so that I can you can let fine. me know if you see him move? That's, okay. That's fine. That's fine. And he's still in the backyard, from what you can tell right oh, now. Yeah, right? I can hear him back. I can hear him back there. I think. I think I hear him back there. There's something back there. Dog's still barking back there in the backyard. Okay. And you saw him jump back there? Yes. Okay. I chased him down there. <laughs> Got it. Okay. okay. He's still back there. Okay. Good. We have officers on the way right now, so we can okay, see where cool. they're at. Hold on. <laughs> We have the helicopter coming out too, see if they can see him. Okay. They got two of my truck windows, both my truck windows, and, and the car across the seat window. Okay. Uh, no, dog's still quiet over there. I hope he's still back there. No, he's still barking. You can hear him on the phone, I'm sure. Okay, yeah. He's still barking back there, so I think he's still there. Okay. Could you tell me about how tall he was, what kind of body style he probably had? Six, probably about six foot tall, maybe six, three, maybe at the most. You know, and he's thin, he's thin built. A black hoodie. Any pattern or stripes or anything on the hoodie? I, I didn't see anything on the hoodie, but the pants have, like, design on it of some sort. You know what I mean? They're not pants like jeans. They're, like, maybe turkey pants type things, I guess. I don't know what, you call them. what kind of design? Uh, like stripes or polka dots, or do you remember? Yes, yeah, just some kind of design. No, I didn't I didn't see too, too, too well because it, it kind of pissed me off. I was more angry than anything else, and I didn't notice what pattern it was. But there's yeah. white dots or white stripes, okay. something like that on Yeah, I'm sure. Once you're adrenaline and kicks in like that, it's hard to... Yeah, yeah. No problem. Yeah. They must all be on the other side of town, huh? All, all the officers. <laughs> yeah, we're actually pulling someone from another district to come, to come down. It's been a busy, busy, night, huh? busy weekend with St. Patrick's Day yeah. and everything. It's been nuts. Oh, but yeah, that's right. That's why we're getting the, the helicopter out there. They can get there a lot faster and they can kind of keep an eye out. And if right. they see him, then they can watch him, you know, until the officers get there. Right. Yeah, we don't need nobody running around here breaking windows at cars. Yeah. No, I agree. I'm glad you saw it. Yeah. Most of the times, uh, it's once by the time you get out there, they're already gone. 
Yeah, you know, I got a whole, my whole truck, I got a truck full of tools, I mean, I'm a mechanic, so I mean, all my tools in my truck, so I mean, I heard that, and I went out there, and if he's lucky to be alive, I would have gotten a hold of him. <laughs> Does he have, I wouldn't did be. he grab any, any of the tools or anything that you know of? No, or? no, he, okay. was, he was just, it was weird, it was weird, was he was just standing next to the truck, right there by my door, and I walked down and said, excuse me, who are you, what are you doing, you know, and then, and then I realized, up. oh, I looked at his and I saw my window was, was busted out, and, uh, that's when, you know, that's when I went after we took off. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And now we have two um, ground units coming, too, that are on Meadowview right now. So they're okay. about a block and a half away. Yep. That dog's going crazy in the backyard, so he's, okay. I think he's still there. Good. I don't know who owns the car across the street from me. <laughs> I have to wait till the police get here first, South Street get here. Yeah. Or I'll go knock on the door and find out whose car that is. Uh, I don't need no more broken windows in my truck. No, definitely, especially if you have all your work tools in there. All my work tools are in there, yep. Is this one of them? Yeah, it's not one of them. Damn. They are, let's see. Digging clothes, huh? Yeah, they're at, uh, they're about to turn on to Meadow, or they're about to turn on to 29th from Meadowview, like, right about now. Okay, I see the helicopter. Good, okay. And then the two ground units are all there. Are. there. You want to wave them down? Yeah, yep, I'm flagging them down. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Bye-bye. Sunday, March 18, 2018, 21 hours, 18 minutes, 37 seconds. And here is the call that was sent out by dispatch. Starting date, Sunday, March 18, 2018, 21 hours, 13 minutes, 5 seconds. Control from Star California calls it up with. Uh, we do have a break into a vehicle call at 29th Street. Apparently he broke some car windows. He's now hiding in that backyard. I just crossed district to Charles 45, so I'm going to copy that. And so copy, is this a known or just a guy that did it, got found and fight now? Uh, the complainant is the victim. He saw the subject break into the windows and then hide in this backyard. And two Charles forty five, the complainant chased the subject into this backyard. Unknown weapons, no further description with other than male with a black hoodie. Charles 5-4, I copy your message to Charles 45, you can click 4. And units on the 921, the subject is a male, 6 foot thin build, black hoodie, dark pants. And so we're going down at 6, looks like I see the complaint in the middle of the street, might be on the phone. Are you with you guys still? Which you order to see last thing with this uh, suspect, last thing going into? Twenty ninth Street. And start coming check clear for any heat. Uh, two, looks like two large dogs in that backyard. Don't start. Uh, they're searching towards the west. Check. There's two very large dogs in the back, not in any or any other heat sources. Uh, and then I do have kind of a suspicious vehicle parked. There's a large field that 
backs up to, that's to the west. I have a uh, vehicle at the far west end uh, near Coral Gables Court. It's just sitting there and it's uh, hot. Okay, sounds good. Oh, it's occupied, uh, no, it's even related at all, but uh, somebody in a driver's seat and just thought, and it's just to the far west end of that field. Clear shot if this guy were to run that way. Can you tell if it's no shrubs. I got a clear shot of both the yards, but there is a uh, uh, shed that's in that uh, far southeast corner or southwest corner. I'm unable to clear that with the uh, with those doors are closed. I do. Uh, two yards to the south of you, though. I got a guy in a backyard that was looking into uh, the window. He's picking up a, looks like a toolbar or some sort of thing. Might be trying to break the window right now. Stand by. Uh, two yards south of you. Breaking the window. Just broke the window. Running south. Running to the south. Two Charles 45. I'm going to set you back on that. Let's get more units. Backyard is running south. He just broke the window, I believe, on the house. As but he's one house to the south that now going to run. Okay, he's running towards the front yard. I like to tell you he's got a hoodie on. He's uh, running towards the front yard of 29th Street. 29th Street. He's looking into another car that's uh, in between the fence and the front yard. Unit's got that looks like might be getting one at gunpoint. Copy one at gunpoint. He's got a perimeter on this guy's running south. He's going to hit this field. Uh, he's at one house, one further house, or one yard to the south. Uh, two units trying to catch him. Sorry, shots fired. Shots fired. Copy, shots fired. Seventies down. No movement. We're going to need additional units. Come in from the uh, west to east of the shark. Star, the 29th Street. I need to start fire and let's get the uh, winter stamina coming. Copy, fire is starting. Enter. 
Sunday, March 18, 2018, 21 hours, 31 minutes, 1 seconds. Um, they said the complainant or the caller followed the subject at the 29th Street where he saw him going to the backyard. Okay. Uh, were you dispatched to that or did you jump in on your own? Uh, initially, I was on a shot spotter call at the time. Okay. When it first came out, we were wrapping that up and just clearing it. Uh -huh. Um, they cross sector. They brought in two Charles forty five okay. from sector four to go to that. Um, to go to the shot spotter call. No, to go to the the car club. Okay. Call. Gotcha. Um, both uh, Mercadell and I were on that shot spotter. Okay. And we cleared that call in order to go to the car club, so the sector four units didn't have to come in. Did they cancel or did they continue? They canceled. Okay. But they were closed forward by dispatch. Okay. Um, all right, Kai, in your own words, um, as far as you just told me about the dispatch, but, um, you know, just like you write your observations uh, from start to finish for the call, um, kind of take me through what happened. Right. Um, do you want me to get in, I can get into detail about, like, the observations in the, the call and what the complainant told her? Yeah. Right. What, what do you need to remember what the complainant said? Uh, it, initially, what I told you about the dispatch was right. about somebody breaking the cars and he followed the, the person. Um, it provided a description of a skinny, tall, I think it said somewhere around 6'1", six, 6'0", six mm -hmm. male black, wearing black clothing with what he thought was like a design on the pants. Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty much the information we had. They provided the address of the 26, or 29th Street, sorry. Um, as the location of the call where the complainant saw the individual go into the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, both uh, Mercadell and I drove there from Sun Valley Circle in 5B. Okay. Um, we left at the same time, arrived nearly at the same time on uh, 29th Street. I arrived pretty much first. I saw a male light who I assumed was a complainant, pointing to the house at um, I got out, talked to him real quick. That's when I activated my body camera. He, he stated that he had seen the individual jump the fence on the north side of the house, like uh, the east fence line, like what's in the, the back of the front yard. Mm -hmm. That's making any sense, I had to draw. Uh, but that, that short little small fence between the property line mm -hmm. and what basically divides the backyard from the front yard. Mm -hmm. um, so that one on the north side of the... Uh, Is he there pointing this out to you? Yeah, he's there pointing it out to me. He, he tells me that the dogs were going crazy, that they were barking a lot, and that in the last minute or so, he didn't hear them barking anymore. Okay. To get a better idea of the location, here are some clips of security footage taken from the neighborhood.
Um, my concern was that individual still being in the backyard, what he was doing back there after breaking out the windows here. What was his, what was he going to do next? If there were people home at that address, I went, I knocked on the window by the front door. I was answered by a woman that lived there. I assume lived there. I kind of gave her a brief synopsis of what was going on. Asked if we could have permission to check her backyard. She stated she needed to put her dogs away. Um, and, but allowed us to go back after waiting at the front door for a few, what felt like a few minutes. Um, she came around from the South side, I guess, uh, garage door, not the main door, but the side door and, uh, told us that the gate was open for that South side entrance to the backyard. Uh, both, uh, Mercadell and I went in there cleared that backyard and uh, didn't find the subject. Okay. Um, at this time, when we pretty much at the same time we arrived or slightly before, the SSD star helicopter was on scene okay. and was giving us updates about, you know, checking that backyard, not seeing anything. I advised him that the comp told me that he ran Westbound over that fence, okay. um, and advised Sarah to maybe check kind of north northwest from there, mm-hmm. and uh, he acknowledged it, or the pilot acknowledged it, and stated that there was a vehicle kind of over by Coral, Coral Gables, mm-hmm. like in that I believe it's a church parking lot that backs up to the houses on the right. Right behind. Yeah, that backs up to the houses along the west side of 29th. Gotcha. Said that there was a car back there. There was somebody in the driver's seat. They were using FLIR cameras, so they only saw the heat, no mm-hmm. description. Um, and we advised we check that after we checked the backyard. Mm-hmm. So back to the backyard. Backyard was clear. Um, both uh, Mercadell and I came out from the backyard, gave an update, update to dispatch that the yard was clear, and asked the star if uh, he still had eyes on that vehicle that was supposed to be in that that parking lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Walking out to my car because I was expecting to drive over there, star gave an update saying that he had an individual in the backyard of a house, approximately two houses south of our location. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't recall him giving an address at that time. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I don't recall him giving the address at that time, but he said that it looked like the individual was attempting to break into that house and that he had a crowbar in his hand. Okay. Stefan Clark was staying with his grandparents, as many of his family members often did for extended periods of time. Clark had only been out of jail for a month and had a history of convictions for robbery, domestic abuse, and prostitution-related offense. While there was no reason for him to be in his neighbor's yard, it was routine for him to hop the back fence onto his grandparents' property to knock on their bedroom window so they would unlock the garage door. The family used this system because their grandparents feared leaving the door unlocked during the night. Right now on my Patreon, you can watch the most jaw-dropping encounter ever captured. This intense footage showcases an intense incident involving a man who wielding a leather katana, aggressively charged towards the police. What unfolded within that crucial moment is way too intense and explicit for YouTube. Head over to patreon.com slash stranger stories plus to access this gripping video and a ton of other Patreon exclusive content. And was trying to break a window. We started, both both Terrence and I moved down, moved, walked south, and then he updated saying that the individual had broken the glass and was trying to break into the house. Okay. Um, we ran down a couple houses. Um, at that time, Stark gave out the address. Of, uh, something like that, I don't remember exactly. Um, and I got a little confused actually and I went a little bit further south 
thinking that the numbers were getting higher as the street went north, but okay. come to find out they were going higher as the numbers went south. Gotcha. Um, Market Ellis stayed a little bit north of where I was. Um, Star gave the update about the breaking of the glass with the crowbar and uh, gave the address and then stated that that individual is now running south over the over the fence into the next yard, mm -hmm. which would have been the same address. Um, and later found that out. Um, Terrence was close to that one. Um, I was further south. Star gave an update saying that the individual was now coming out towards 29th Street. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in that time frame is when uh, I heard Terrence yelling at the suspect. You, where are you at this point? Are you at on that, 29th Street or are you? I'm, yeah, we're both still on 29th Street. I'm on the west side park, uh, west side sidewalk. So is Terrence. I'm about a house and a half further south than him. Okay. Expecting an individual to maybe come running up that way. Towards you. Towards me. Towards the street or okay. south. Um, as soon as I heard Terrence yelling at the suspect, I ran back north towards Terrence and followed him into the backyard of 25th Street. Okay. As, uh, as we hit the corner, the northwest corner of the, of the house in the backyard, I observed the suspect standing say, approximately what I thought was around 15 to 20 feet away mm -hmm. um, in the isosceles position with his hands punched out in front of him holding an object. Um, I got to digress, I forgot to mention that when clearing the backyard of my tack light stopped working okay. and I was using my flashlight. Okay. So due to the, due to the subject breaking the, breaking the glass, thinking maybe he was trying to break into the house, what completely unknown what he had in his hands when when Terrence followed him in the backyard, I had not seen the subject up until that point where we hit that corner. Okay. As soon as I turned the corner, I saw him punched out like that. When you say punched out like that, can punched you out with the isosceles hands, both hands on an object like this. Clark was holding a cell phone at the time of his death. Later, they found out it wasn't even his and belonged to his girlfriend. There were metal bars in the yard and he might have been carrying one before dropping it when Robinette and Mercottle confronted him. But it was too dark to determine whether or not that was the case. Okay, when you say isosceles, where, where do you know that from? Training, range training, firearms training, go to the isosceles stance because okay. it's a triangle. Your arms form a triangle, your feet are positioned usually about shoulder length apart. Okay. That's a common firing position for a uh, I mean, you know, we were taught in firearms training, taught that in Border Patrol, taught that here. Okay. Um, I recognize that as a position somebody shoots from. Okay. At the, the, I could see that there was something in the suspect's hands. I wasn't able to make it out. I saw something, reflection of what I thought was a metal object um, in his hand from the reflection of our, our lights to the backyard was really dark. It was hard to see, make out anything clear. All I saw was a subject in dark clothing standing in that position with his hands punched out with something in his hands. Uh, Mercadell yelled gun out of instinct. I ducked behind the corner real quick and covered, came back around and to get an idea what was going on, um, saw the suspect still standing in that position, still punched out at us. I honestly was really surprised that I hadn't heard gunshots yet, and to protect myself and, and Terrence, I fired what I thought was five rounds on scene, and later thought was maybe more. Okay. Um, at that time, uh, Terrence started firing as well. Okay. When did you stop firing? As a 
was supposed to make the to the ground. Okay. Um, why? I didn't feel like there was a threat anymore. Okay. Um, that registered in your... Clark's family wanted an independent autopsy done when they weren't satisfied with the coroner's verdict. Unfortunately, the doctor they chose mistook exit wounds for entry wounds, which muddied the waters and increased the anger of the general public. There was another autopsy, which was independently confirmed by three other pathologists. They agreed that Clark had been shot once in the front of the left thigh, three times directly to the side, and three times in the right side of the back, and corroborated the officer's story that the police shot Clark when he was approaching them. Yeah, the, the suspect was down and there was no threat anymore. Okay. Um, when you came around the corner and, and when you say you saw him punch down like that, how did you feel? How did that make you feel? I was scared, like I said, I was scared he was going to shoot us. Okay. I really felt like that was a gun. His position, like I said, was something I recognize as a firing position from all the training, all the firearms training that I've been through in the last nine years. And when you said uh, you were surprised you didn't hear gunshots yet, what did you mean? I was surprised that he hadn't started firing at us. So not that, because he, he had, as we hit that corner, I know Terrence was a little bit in front of me, and I know he actually came out past the corner. Okay. Um, he completely had the drop on us, meaning that he would have started, could have started shooting and would have easily hit Terrence. Five seven shots fired, seven eight down. Show me your hands! I see your hands! Five seven, he's down. No movement. We're gonna need additional units. Come in from the uh, west to east of this yard. Let's see your hands. You all right? You hit? Yeah, I'm good. All right. He was still pointing. Oh shit! When I saw him, you all right, dude? Yeah, I'm all right. I don't think I've hit or anything. I got him a gunpoint, dude. Right. You wanna, what you, you wanna do? You do a tactical reload, okay? All right, copy. I think I shot about five times. Stand by. Stand by on that. He's still down, he's not moving. We can't see the gun. You good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm gonna reload. All right, okay. go. I got you. Go. You got a light on him? Got him. Negative. Neither one of us are hit. We're okay. Suspect's down. was further into the yard than you? He was in front of me when we hit that corner. Okay, are yeah. you are you on the inside or the outside of Terrence as far as the corner? If the corner's right here, I'm on the inside, and he was to my right. Okay, and this is a, a left turn into the yard? A left turn into the yard, yes. Okay, um, so you're closer to the house than Terrence? Yes. Okay, um, had you seen the suspect prior to making that corner? No. Okay. Uh, that's the first time I saw it. Okay. Let's talk about after um, the shooting, what happened then? Uh, both Terrence and I gave commands. Terrence updated it over there. The shots were fired. Um, I know Star was on the radio. I don't remember what he was saying. Um, but we sat there. We couldn't see... I couldn't see the suspect's hands at all. Terrence said he couldn't see the left hand, um, but I couldn't see either hand at that point. Okay. Terrence was down on one knee, kind of like below me, taking cover behind the same corner, and I was above him. Mm -hmm. um, we were issuing commands, shows his hands, shows his hands, um, and that's when uh, Taylor and Trujillo showed up. Okay. We, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm 
digress a little bit. As we're issuing commands, I had Terrence do a tactical reload, and then when he had his completed and was back on target with the suspect, I completed, I went behind cover and completed one myself. Okay. And Trujillo and Taylor showed up. Okay. Do you remember asking for a body bunker? Yes. Why did you ask for a body bunker? Because if the suspect had a gun and was not injured or still alive at that point, I didn't want to approach to detain him in fear that he might still be able to get rounds off on us. Okay. At some point, did you guys approach? Were you part of that? When Sergeant Morris showed up, it was Mercadale, Taylor, and Trujillo, Morris, and I. Sergeant Morris just said, we got to go at that point, and we approached. By that time, the suspect hadn't moved at all and wasn't responding to any of our commands, any pleas to say something to us or anything like that. Okay. So we made the decision to approach, detain him, and start CPR. Okay. Did you ever have any opportunity to provide any after-force care to him? Once Clark was down, officers shouted to him to ask if he was all right and to let them know if he had dropped his weapon. They could not approach until they could be sure he was unarmed. For five minutes, Clark lay on the ground until officers attempted to give him medical aid. No, I didn't. I was called away from that scene by Sergeant Morris. Okay. As far as you know, somebody else was doing that? Yes. Okay. When you say called away, what do you mean? He summoned us to come away. You? Okay. Us as in Mercadale and me, Sergeant Morris did. Okay, gotcha. Let's back up just a little bit. When you guys got there, you mentioned that there was some broken glass and stuff. We didn't talk about what that was or what you saw when you got there. What did you see? When I got there and met with the complainant, he did point out that the suspect had broken the glass out of his truck and went south a couple houses. I'm not sure how many houses or what his address actually was, but he pointed down towards a couple cars on the street. You could see broken glass from the side windows on the ground, or what I assumed was from the side windows on the ground. And then I observed another vehicle, I think in front of or around there. There was like a wrought iron gate section of it, probably about four feet wide, but however tall it was, laying on the sidewalk. There was broken glass out of a car that was parked next to that section of fence all over the ground. So how many cars had broken glass, if you know? I'd say that one for certain. I don't know exactly how many were broken from the original complainant's house. The guy you talked to in the street, did he say it was one of his cars? Yeah, he said it was his cars that had the windows broken out of. By the person who had just jumped the fence? Yeah. Okay. When you were clearing the first backyard, you said your attack light went out? Yeah. Is that attached to your gun? It is. Okay, and so you have a flashlight that you keep? Yes. Was it out, completely out? Because like I have one that turns off and on, off and on. The flashlight? Your attack light. It was completely out. I tried to work the action a few times to get it to work, but it was not working. So it never came back on? It never came back on. You're right-handed, right? Yeah. So when you said you used your flashlight, was your flashlight with your left hand? It was. Okay. Do you know if Terrence has an attack light or a flashlight? I believe he has an attack light, but I don't know for certain. Okay. I know he did have a light out on the subject. The backyard in that house, how was the lighting? It was nonexistent except for my flashlight and Terrence's light. So what could you see? What area? I could see what our light was on, which at that point was pretty much the suspect. I saw mostly his midsection. I'd say from his mid-stomach down to his knees. Okay. Can you see anything that's not within your flashlight? No, it was really dark. I couldn't see. 
Um, I could I could tell that there was like a structure around him. I couldn't tell exactly what it was. Okay. Did you hear anybody in the house at all? No. Okay. Do you remember if there were any cars in the driveway? There was an older car that I like. I thought it was like a Chevy that put that on a radio. It was like a landmark for other units coming in to recognize it's the house. And then there was a SUV like further in the driveway. Okay. That we did the house look like somebody lived there? It looked like abandoned. Or could you tell? I couldn't tell. Okay. Um, do you remember the suspect saying anything at all? He didn't say a single thing. Okay. Um, did you give any commands? No. Okay. The commands that you remember hearing Terrence give, what do you remember him saying? I remember him saying the show us his hands. Uh, other than that, I don't remember what he said. Okay. Show me what I'm doing! Um, you said you and Terrence came from the other call. Were you guys following each other pretty much the whole way? Yeah, he was following me. Did you um, have any conversation during that time, or was it just... No, I just want to call him the next. Just get to the next call. Okay. Um, did you guys have any opportunity to talk to each other about the call or what the plan was or anything like that? No, we kind of worked it out as we went along. Okay. Um, it was like, kind of go check on. this backyard. And then I know we talked about, like, as we were getting an update about the car in the back, we're like, hey, we'll check this yard and we'll clear it, make sure everything's okay. And then we'll go to the next, to the to the backyard, to that car and check that out. And you're kind of working off of the STARS updates, basically. Exactly. Okay. Um, you ever remember seeing the guy before, the suspect before? I have no idea who he is. Okay. Um, how about with the complaint there in the street or that particular street? Have you been there before? I've been to calls on 29th Street before. I don't recognize the complainant from this call. Okay, specifically those couple of houses that you can remember ever being. Uh, okay. I can't remember. Okay, cool. Um, There's always something I forget to ask you, so I'm sure we'll have to come back. But uh, do you have any questions? I uh, know. Okay. Um, we'll take a break. Uh, I'll take you guys back out to the room you're just waiting in. Um, and I'm sure as soon as I do that, I'll remember what I was supposed to ask you. So uh, let's take a break. Grab a drink of water. Okay. 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 Things I know some of them we touched on. Uh, we'll try to get a little more into it. Okay. Um, do you and Terrence ride together as partners ever? No. Um, has he, have you guys been on teams before together? Terrence rode with me one day when he was in training. Okay. Um, just as like a substitute. Okay. Field training officer. Okay. He's on your team though. Are you guys on the same team? He's on the same team as me now. Is that since the beginning of the year? Yes. Okay, so two and a half months. Whenever that was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but as far as partners, he rode with you one day in training and then. Yeah, a couple of years. Like when he was, I think he may have been phase one at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, are you injured at all? No. Okay. Um, do you wear an earpiece in your ear? I do. Okay, it's not. I don't see it now, is it? No, I took. I did take that off. Okay. It's attached to my vest. Okay. I, while the police department acknowledged that muting the mics did not reflect well on the officers, they had previously been advised by attorneys to do so to prevent recording any comments that could be used in administrative or criminal proceedings. Took off as well. Okay, I noticed on the body camera I couldn't hear the dispatch at all, but you guys seemed to, so I was curious anyway. Um, let's talk about your mindset a little bit. Um, when you came around the corner, uh, and I think we, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you described kind of coming around the first time and then like taking a double take, is that right? Yes. And both times you saw the suspect uh, in the isosceles, as yes. you described. Yeah. Um, 
Could you tell if um, he was in the same position or had he moved? He appeared to be in the same position. Okay. Um, and right in that moment, and not considering what, you know, after the fact, um, what do you remember thinking in your head? Right at that moment? Yeah, when you came around the corner and you saw him. To be that. frank, it was, oh shit. And that's also when, you know, I was really surprised that he hadn't started shooting on us. Okay. Um, what were you concerned about? Uh, I was concerned about getting shot and I was concerned about Terrence getting shot. Oh, and where was Terrence? Terrence at that point was to my right a little bit behind. Okay. Um, behind the house or was he kind behind, of exposed? Like, he was, ex he was more exposed than I was. Okay. Um, he was further into the backyard. Like, he had not really necessarily stopped at that corner when where I stopped to get a view of the, what was going on. So he, he exposed himself into the backyard okay. where I stopped to uh, take a little bit of cover at the corner of the house. Um, and you said you were surprised that you weren't taking rounds. Taking rounds. Yeah. Um, and is that when you decided to fire? I, it was, it was instantaneous. Okay. It was a situation that was just, it was so quick. I hit the corner. I knew Terrence had traveled further into the backyard than I did and was exposed. Terrence yelled gun. I tucked in real quick, came back out, saw him in the same position and still being surprised that I wasn't taking rounds this whole time. Decided to fire and in the, in the threat before we actually started taking rounds. Okay. Um, and it, we're talking about an instantaneous situation. Okay. Um, There's a way I perceive it. In that moment, did you feel like you had any other choice? No. Okay. Um, Did you feel like there was a deadly threat to you and Terrence? Yes. Um, okay. Could you see anything behind the suspect? How was your background? I could see... I should say I couldn't really see it. It was dark. But you could tell that there was a fence. Is okay. that is that are you, understandable? Are you familiar with that area at all? Do you know what the background is? Um, in, in that particular backyard? Right. Well, what's beyond where the suspect was? Um, no. Okay. no. Um, Afterwards, uh, after the shooting, when you guys approached, do you remember seeing a, a cell phone on the ground? Yes. Do you know whose cell phone that is? No. Okay, do you remember what color it was? It was uh, white with a black case, I believe. Okay. Okay, I think I'm done. Do you have any questions? No. Do you have any questions? No. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's down, I'll play it up for good. And, uh, Double check and good. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we're we're good. Uh, okay. I'll have you guys step up. Okay. Is there anything I need to put on more? Or? No. There were several other officers on scene, and they were called in to give their account of events. First is Officer Craig Hills. Do you guys have a, does DOJ have a parking garage? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And I'm Todd Cole. Craig Archer. This is Terrence. Yeah, we met. We met. Okay. Yeah, Terrence Brest, California Department of Justice. That's all right. I'll give you my card if you have any questions. And Craig, could I just get your name for the record? Yeah, Craig, C R A I G Hills, H I L L S. So, Mick. Michael Boyd, B O Y D, with the Sacramento Police Officer Association. All right, perfect. Thank you guys for coming down here. I just have a few questions. We all just watched the video, so that's more or less what we're going to be talking about. Craig, I just want to ask you a little bit of background as far as on March 18th, were you working as a police officer? Yes, I was. Okay. And what were you doing that day? So, I was assigned patrol. I work Sector 4, Graveyard. We were in the middle of a briefing at the time of the events and stuff. So, basically, we wrapped up patrol, or wrapped up briefing real quick and headed down to the scene. Okay. And were you wearing a full uniform? Yes, I was. Driving a marked police car? Yes, I was. Okay. How long have you been a police officer? I'll be coming up on three years this June. Okay. All three years with Sacramento? Yes. Actually, I did a little bit in Elk Grove in training, but I didn't pass training down there. Okay. And when was that? What year was that? 2015. 2015. And then when did you get hired on with Sac PD? Oh, sorry. Okay. So, 2012 was Elk Grove. Okay. Maybe 2013. And then 2015, I started the academy with Sacramento. With Sac PD. Okay. Do you have any prior military experience? Yes. I was in the Navy for six years. Navy for six years. Okay. How did the call come out? So, I don't remember how the call came out. We didn't have our radios on. We did at some point when we started hearing the helicopter was overhead. And honestly, we were listening a little bit. We knew that there was something going on. We heard the beeper. And then, obviously, the helicopter at some point put out shots fired. And that's when, basically, we all wrapped up briefing and started rolling out. Okay. Were you riding by yourself that night? Yes. Okay. What were you thinking? What were the thoughts that were going through your head as you were responding to that call? Just initially was the concerns for the officers that were down there and what's going on. Because we knew just real briefly what the helicopter was putting out. And I remember before I started rolling down there that Officer Robinette put out that all officers were okay. So, that helped slow things down a little bit. But we just knew, I knew that there was an OIS going on. And that they were going to need lots of bodies. So, that's where I was headed. Okay. Was there any question that you thought about that day that you were going to be called to the South Area Police Department? So, I've been working in the South Area pretty much as soon as I went solo. And I was assigned to Robinette's team. So, I've pretty much been working patrol with Robinette. And once you go solo, you're out of training and you're, you know. Yeah. Still on probation, but finished my training. Okay. So, ever since that time, you've been working in South Sacramento. Are you on probation still? No, I'm on probation. And by probation, we mean a probationary officer. Yes. With the department. So, you know Robinette just from working around him. Have you guys ever worked on the same team together? Yeah, we were assigned Team 29, I believe it is, Sector 5 Swings. For the last two years, we worked together prior to this year. And then this year, you worked graveyards? Yes. Okay. So, did you recognize his voice as he was putting it out? Yes. Okay. I recognized his voice and I knew his identifier, you know, just from earlier in the year. Just picked it up being in the South. Okay. So, now I'm going to get into the video. You come on scene and it shows you walking up. Now, the video has about 30 seconds where you don't hear anything. Is that typical in these body-worn camera videos? There is a 30-second delay. And for that instance, normally that would have been activated in the car. I just know part of the thing was we were in a rush to get out the door, obviously, to get down there and help. I probably didn't turn on my body cam when I left the station. So, as soon as I got out of the car, I realized I didn't have it on, turned it on. So, you manually turned your body camera on? Yeah. Not the car from going to Code 3? That's correct. Okay. 
So your camera, is it fair to say, was in the off position as you drove down there, you realized, oh, I haven't even turned it on yet, turned it on, and do you have to do something else to activate it or just turn it on? Yeah, you have to, I believe, double tap it. So you double tap it mm -hmm. and then that's when it starts rolling. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Uh, now, in, in that 30 seconds of audio, it shows uh, you're walking up and there's a, an older male white talking <laughs> to an officer. Do you remember anything? So, that? yeah, I remember that. Just, we had, so there's a lot on the tape kind of everywhere, lines of tape, different perimeters. When you say tape, like uh, crime scene tape? Yes. Okay. And so I, I had stopped before the first layer of crime scene tape. Right. So, um, but as soon as I got in, I noticed this gentleman was there. And um, so I started talking to him. I said, hey, what are you, what are you doing here? Because um, he's, you know, in one line of crime scene tape. And he's like, oh, I was just curious what's going on. So I started walking down the sidewalk. I was like, you can't be here. I mean, do you know what happened here? He's like, no, that's why I just wanted to see what was going on. And I said, well, no, you, you can't be down here. You need to go on the other side of the tape. And so that, that was that. That was your interaction right yeah. there in that brief 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's get to, you walk up, you see Officer Robinette, mm -hmm. and you say something to the effect, uh, how are you doing? And he says, I'm good. Yeah. Is that... Basically? Yeah, and that was it. I mean, we kind of, it's one of those, I knew what had happened. Something had happened. Did you know that Officer Robinette was involved at that point in time? Um, I didn't. I had the suspicion that he was because he was on the call. He was the one that put out all officers are okay, so um, I had a, a feeling that he was involved, and I knew we couldn't really talk about it, so I'm just trying to get the feeling for how he's doing. Okay. So. Um, and then at one point, he turned your body camera off. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys talk about after that body camera gets turned um, um, Just the stress and, you know... Um, whatever he's feeling at the moment. Um, it's just, um, like, I remember he kind of said some stuff um, about, you know, um, he's kind of getting stuff off his chest because he just went through the event, but he, he said, you know, I swore it was a gun, and he took he took that stance. So I remember him saying that, um, and then, like, I didn't, I didn't have him talk anymore. I don't remember anything he said after that, really. It was more just, I could tell from dealing with him in the past, you know, that it, it was affecting him, and, you know, um, he kind of was emotional about it. Um, but that's all I can um, remember. Do you remember about how long the uh, conversation lasted? I don't. Um, I remember I was, if I recall, um, because I, I met with him twice that night, and I believe that one, I think uh, other officers were around, and we were kind of joking with him and stuff like that. I remember... Later on? Is that may have been later on, because okay. I, I think that first one was really quick. I don't so, remember. So I, I'll just tell you, based on the videos we just watched, um, your body camera turns off at 21.39.04, mm -hmm. and then turns back on at... 21:41:33. Two minutes and 30 mm -hmm. seconds later, and you're, that's when you see you're walking with, uh, uh, I believe it's Officer Taylor or it's right. some, someone else. Yeah. Uh, other Robinette was not shown on your on your body camera, mm -hmm. and you were kind of walking towards another. So so that was it. Like I just checked in with Robinette real quick, so you know how he's doing, and then I wanted to get useful as I could because. You know, I know they need lots of bodies, so I started walking down. At some point, I was, I think I was talking to Taylor about, um, hey, what, what do we need? What's going on? Um, do we have cameras going on? That kind of stuff. So. Okay. So, as, well, that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, after, after you uh, talked to Robin that for, we'll, we'll say, uh, that two minute and, and 30 something second window about that. Mm -hmm. um, then you walk off and uh, your body camera reactivates. Do you remember if you turned it on? What, how did that work? Uh, I would have to have turned it on okay. because he, he slid it off. So I would have to slide it on and double tap and it. Double right tap it. it. Okay. And then um, it appears like <clears throat> you have that same 30 second or so um, uh, previous where it, it's, it's muted. muted. It's muted. Um, uh, and then uh, it goes live and then you immediately. Mm -hmm. immediately mute the camera after that. Right. Um, what 
what were you doing after that, I guess? So most of it was really um, just trying to figure out what I could do to help people. Um, so I was checking with different people, um, um, finding out where they needed bodies, what I could help out with. And I, at some point, I know um, I talked to Sergeant Bell because she was kind of coming off, or she was dealing with a lot of the stuff. Um, so she took down my my uh, identifier because she knew I was working graves. Um, and she said something about <clears throat> going on to the, the far end where I had originally parked um, to see if they need anything up there. Um, I started going there. At some point, she came over the radio and said, hey, can you be seen recorder up there? Um, <clears throat> and so I started getting paperwork and stuff like that together um, for that. And um, after maybe just a minute, I was still getting the paper ready to go. And she came back over the air and said, hey, we don't need you up there. I didn't realize we have it down here, um, so we don't need you. So then I walked back down, um, again, started talking with Robinette again. Um, and that was just, um, we were just trying to talk with him and have a conversation. Um, nothing in particular, just. Did he tell you any specific details of the shooting while you were speaking to him? Um, There was just that that thing that I said about him um, saying, you know, I thought it was a gun and he took that stance at me, but other than that, I don't recall anything about, because I, I, I think I even had asked, like, um, which house is this scene at? Because um, they, at some point, Sergeant Bell comes down and she says, hey, I need a body and I offer up. And, I ended up getting placed in the backyard. Um, and that's oh, I of the... Uh, where the incident happened. Where the incident happened. Mm -hmm. okay. So I was there for most of the evening. What time was that? Um, it was fairly soon. I want to say within half an hour of me arriving on scene. Uh, I was in the backyard and I stayed there the whole time. And was it just you in the backyard? Um, no. Um, Initially, there was Officer Phillips back there as well, um, but he was swings. Um, at some point, he got pulled aside, um, and I was back there. Um, it switched a couple times, but I was back there, and I think um, I'm having a hard time remembering his name. He's another guy. But there's another officer yeah, there's a, back there with you. Sector 5, Graves. I remember it's, you know. Was your body camera on while you were back there? No, no. Uh, we got told to turn off the body cams before we entered the backyard. Okay. So. Um, is that, uh, I guess, is, is that a, a standard procedure at that time? Was that a standard procedure to mute your body camera or turn it off? Do, um. For what I was familiar with prior to, because um, I was on another homicide prior to, and yeah, we have, when homicide's kind of taking over the scene and everything, we turn off all our body cams. So, okay. um, and they handle everything. So, um, I was told before entering to turn it off, and, that, and so I just, that seemed familiar to me, so I had it off. Okay. Um, yeah, just two follow-up questions. You said, you said the second contact that you had with Officer Robin yet. Do you remember any part of that conversation? Uh, I remember like a little bit, like because um, there was a few of us there. I remember um, talking about where people were. At some point, uh, somebody says, "We're all here because we care about you," and I shake my head, no, at Robin, yet, just joking, because. We worked together for a while, um, and that was it. And um, you remember Robin that said anything about the incident? Um, I mean, I, I just I remember the incident, but I don't remember when I heard about the incident. So, um, but um, he did, like I said, he said I know that he had chased somebody. Um, he had told me at some point that he only um, thought he shot maybe six times. Um, 
But I don't, because because I was in the backyard. I don't remember if he told me that by the car or if that was because I watched them do their walkthrough. So I don't recall. Um, because I think he does say he tells me a little bit of, about the incident, kind of coming off his chest, but I don't remember the specifics. Because. Yeah. All right, and you said you said you, you made the reference we or there were more than one officer during the second contact that was present. Yeah, um, I don't remember who all was there. I was there. Um, uh, officer Antonetti from the bike team that was there at some point. She was the one that asked the question initially, and she was encouraging Robinette. Um, and. I don't like Paul, Paul who, who was there. Perfect. So. Thank you. No further. Um, all right. Let's all take a break. Unless you, make, unless you got anything. No, I'm good. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll leave my tape recorder going, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Okay. Hill wasn't on the scene until after the shooting had occurred. But his information, limited as it is, doesn't contradict Robinette. Next, the police interviewed Officer Logan Howard. So I'm going to make 
make sure he's okay. Uh, so I went up to him and said, hey, man, are you all right? Everything okay? You good? If you need anything, let me know. Okay. And I continued. Okay. And then um, a little while later, uh, there, again, while your body camera was still muted, um, you were speaking with uh, Sergeant Morse. Correct. Uh, can you tell me what, what that conversation consisted of? Uh, when I initially got into his area of presence, um, he was still working some other things out, wasn't, wasn't talking to us. Uh, but there was a handful of us uh, just kind of standing and waiting for assignments. Um, I had heard over the air that he needed, uh, he needed people to begin canvassing. So I went to the area that we were told to meet um, and uh, waited for my assignment when in, in the body cam. Uh, when I'm face to face talking to him, he's giving me um, an assignment on which houses to canvas in the neighborhood. Okay, and then um, again, uh, a little bit after that, uh, while your body camera is still muted, um, you have another conversation with uh, a different officer, with um, Officer. Calabrese? Calabrese, yes. Calabrese. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what that conversation consisted of? Yeah, I was on my way to do my canvas, and uh, he stopped and I said something about uh, the license plates um, being attached. And I was like, uh, it would usually voice a license plate over the air, so it's connected to the call. Um, but I was like, I don't know. And I was like, go ahead and do it if you want. And he's like, well, I don't want to put it on the radio right now. And then uh, that was all. Okay. Do you know what license plates he was talking about? I don't. I would assume we were standing in front of a car that had a broken window. Okay. Um, at that point, I uh, was assuming he was talking about that one because there was glass. Um, but I wasn't sure if he was speaking of those or just all the vehicles inside the perimeter. Um, I didn't really clarify him. I had another task. So I wasn't going to get sidetracked and do that. So I continued on my task. Okay. Um, and then there was one more conversation again while your body camera is muted uh, that you had with um, Officer Lazaro. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me about that conversation? Uh, yeah, I was just telling him that I was assigned to canvas the neighborhood, and uh, he was next to like a trailer in a front yard. Um, and I asked him, uh, from what I recall, um, was if he was going to take that house or what. So it, it, from what I recall, I obviously didn't go to the door. So um, just from what I remember, um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but I asked him if I needed to do a canvas at that house from what I recall, and I didn't really get a clear answer, so I just said, okay, well, I'll, I know I need to do these, so I'll do these houses. And then that's when my cam, I was approaching the first house and I unmuted my body camera. Okay. Um, yeah, just a, just a quick question. I had the same opportunity that you had to take a look at the body camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> when you initially spoke with or um, came in contact with Wabinette and the other officer, mm -hmm. I know you said you were just checking on them, but do you remember exactly what was said, what you said, what they said? Um, I remember asking him if he was okay. Yeah, who's this you're talking about? Officer Robinette. Okay. Uh, just like I explained, um, I had heard on the radio shots fired from Sector 4, and we were on a different channel than 4 and 5. Okay. Um, so when I switched over was when I was responding. Um, and Officer Robinette came up on the radio and said, just to be clear, all officers are okay. Uh, we are not hurt. I was like, okay, he, something happened, but Sector 4 is involved. So that's what I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw that his buddy was Tatanko, mm -hmm. uh, your sign of buddy during critical incidents. Okay. So I just, you know, I, I've known him. Um, you talk about Robinette? Or yes, I've known Robinette. Okay. Um, you know, since I've been here. Okay. So um, I just asked them, I was like, hey, are you okay? Um, I knew better than to ask him about the specifics of the incident. Mm -hmm. um, so I know for fact that it was nothing uh, involving what had gone on. It 
was just checking his welfare. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do remember thinking about that. I'm like, okay, you know, everybody's curious. They want to know what happened, but I know I can't ask him. Um, so I just, all I remember was saying, hey, man, are you okay? Um, yeah, man, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Um, is there anything I can do? What do you need? Make sure you're good. And like, you know, something, you know, it was a big, big scene. So, um, and that's, that's really all I recall. Um, but like I said, you know, I knew her, but I do know better than to um, have those conversations on this sort of scene um, with anybody involved or anybody in general. So. Okay. Right. Okay. Any, anything else? No, that's no. it. Okay. Do you have anything to add? No? Okay. Um, why don't we take a break? Okay. Um, and then if we need to, we'll, uh, we'll come back. Okay. Okay. All right. Now I'll leave my report. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So it's on and running. It's on and running. Give you a Uh, why don't we all... Yeah, you can ask me going on. Come on. Okay. Howard, like Hill, was a late arrival to the scene and did not witness anything directly relevant to the shooting. Next to be interviewed is Officer Lundgren. Um, so we're going to, I wanted to speak with you regarding the incident that happened um, on Sunday, March 18th. Um, and um, there's, so before we came in here, you had a chance to review your supplement and then uh, also watch your body worn. Uh, camera footage um, and so there's just some things that we need to clarify with that okay um, but first um, can you tell me uh, when you were on the way to the call and you were hearing the updates over the radio what what was going through your mind uh, well, my partner and I were uh, sitting down for code 7 mm-hmm. we heard this call come out we heard air get overhead and start putting out that they had eyes on him. He was um, starting to move south throughout through the, the backyards. So we had our radios up and we're listening to it and it's just like any other call. Um, officers arrive on scene, they mark on scene, um, and then we get updates from air that you know they see him breaking out a sliding glass window. He's continuing south, up and over a fence. Officers are making contact, and then the original shots fired call came out from air. When that came out, my partner and I ran to our patrol vehicle, got in, and started moving towards the call. Okay. And so as you're going to the call, um, what and you're hearing the, the updates from STAR and from dispatch um, and from the officers, what's going through your mind? Uh, what's going through my mind is that officers just uh, um, had to shoot at the suspect. and. In my mind, I was going through, are my officers okay, are they safe? Um, an update did come out that officers were safe, but you still have that concern for your teammates and your fellow officers that any time that there's a, an incident that involves a discharge of firearm, there's always that level of the officer's life was in danger or somebody's life was in danger. So my, my fear was one of them was injured, but okay. Okay. And so, um, have you ever worked with either of the officers prior to the incident on Sunday? Uh, both officers involved in the incident um, are members of my team. I work with them every day out of the week. Okay. Um, had you, prior to um, this year, had you worked with them previously? Prior to this year, no. Okay. Um, and so... You guys have known each other since the beginning of the year, essentially your teammates, um, and work closely together. Yes, one of them is my direct beat partner. And which one is that? It's Rob Bennett. Okay, and so when you say beat partner, can you explain that a little bit? <clears throat> District 5 is broken into three beats, A, B, and C. There's mm-hmm. officers assigned to uh, A, B, and C. Officer Rob Bennett, myself, Officer McLean are all District 5 uh, B cars. So okay. when a call comes out in District B, Mm-hmm. Those units are responding to those, so we handle most calls for service together. Okay, so it would be fair to say that uh, a majority of the calls that you respond to for service would be with either Officer Robinette or your other B partner? Correct. Okay. 
Um, I want to go to <clears throat> your body worn camera video okay. um, that you had a chance to, to review. Um, I want to talk about um, when you first arrive on scene mm -hmm. and you um, approach Officer Robinette and Officer Mercadale. Mm -hmm. um, you, can you please explain to me um, the reasoning behind you muting your body worn camera? When I made contact with them, we walked out to the street. <clears throat> um, the cameras were muted because we were going to have a personal conversation about my concern for them. Um, my concern for them was still that they were injured or hurt, um, physically or emotionally. And so the uh, body cams were muted, and I asked them, hey, are you guys okay? Okay. So is that what the conversation consisted of? That was the conversation. Okay. And what was their response? Um, I think my exact words were, hey, are you guys okay? And I think they both just said, yeah. And I said, are you guys hurt? And they said, no. Um, and then Rob, Officer Robinette said, um, okay, I don't remember that. I think I might have said, <clears throat> where is he? And they pointed to the backyard. And then I turned to go to the backyard. And I think Officer Robinette said, we're on ice. And the way I took that was we were just involved in an incident. We can no longer investigate, talk to anyone. We need to sit around and wait for the sergeant to be on scene. That was my impression. Okay. But I moved and I went to the backyard, reactivated my body cam, and then sound should have come back on. Okay. Um, and then going back to your body worn camera, um, there's one point when you are in the backyard. Uh, and you were in the backyard with Officer Trujillo. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you mute your body more. Can you again um, explain the reasoning behind uh, you muting it at that time and also the conversation that was be held between you and Officer Trujillo? I don't recall seeing that. I don't know if I got to that point in the video. Okay. Do you, um, after you muted your body worn during your interaction with Officer Lung, or Officer uh, Mercadal and Robin, mm -hmm. do you, and you stated that you turned the sound back on as you were going mm -hmm. in the backyard, do you recall um, at any point muting your body camera again? I believe I re-muted my body cam after uh, fire pronounced okay. and I backed off from the body Okay. and then I was stationary back there and I muted okay do you recall any conversations that you had while you were in the backyard and your body camera was muted <clears throat> for clarity is officer Trujillo a male or female a female um, I think after fire pronounced and I'm not sure my status of my body cam at the time um, we moved south in the yard to look for um, bullet holes, see where the bullets went. I don't know if my body cam was muted at that time or not, but the conversation her and I were having back there were, I think I found one here, I think I found one here, looks like it didn't penetrate the fence here, making sure that there's no over penetration, no, uh, no additional victims anywhere else. Okay. Um... So is it is it safe to say that you don't remember if you muted it, muted your body camera, or if the sound was still on? Uh, I know for a fact at one point after the incident was over, mm -hmm. I muted my camera because I was the only officer in that backyard by myself. The incident was over, and I muted my body cam. Okay. Um, and then, again, while you were in the backyard, mm -hmm. a little while later, um, officer, two officers, um, they looked to be checking the, the field to the west and looked over the, the f property fence line. Um, and, and it looked like they may have had some sort of dialect with you. Yes. Um, could you please explain what, what was said during that conversation? Um, the first officer, if I recall correctly, was Officer Spring. 
Um, he poked his head over and he said, Lundgren? And I said, yeah, who is that? And he goes, Spring. I said, hey, was you good? He said, yeah, I'm fine. Um, he goes, do you need anything? I said, no, I'm, I'm good right now. I feel like I'm going to be back here for a long time, just holding the scene. Um, he said, all right, um, give me a call if you, if you need anything. And I said, give me your number. I wrote down his phone number. Um, and he's roommates with my B partner, Officer McLean. So I said, hey, will you please call or text McLean and tell him where I am? Because your B partner and your, your two-man car, they want to know where each other are. And we got separated. So I said, hey, just, just call him, tell him in the backyard, I'm okay. And so he popped his head down and he left. And then I think uh, either right after that or shortly after that, uh, Officer Grant poked his head over and said, hey, you doing good back here? And I said, yeah. Um, and I said, what, and I said, what brought you all the way down from, from the hospital? Because he's a hospital car at Sutter. And he said, uh, and he said, Sundays are overlap, so I get to get out on patrol. And I said, oh, okay. He goes, yeah, we heard, heard the call and uh, came down. I said, well, we appreciate it. I think that was about it. Okay. Um, do you remember if there were any other conversations that were had between you and any other, any other officers um, prior to you completely shutting down your body-worn camera, other than the ones that we've already spoken about? Um, I don't know if my body cam was on or not, and I don't even know what sergeant it was. But a sergeant came back to that that like three or four foot fence line okay. that separated the front yard from the back yard, mm -hmm. and said, "You doing it back here?" I said, "Yes." He says, "All right, no one's to come back here without my approval, or sergeant's approval, or lieutenant's approval." And I said, "Copy that." He left. Um, I hung out a little bit longer. Another officer came back, or um, the other member of the gang unit. Um, came back and said, "Hey, they want uh, they want all of us to get back to the station." Um, and another officer came and relieved me. I think that is it. Okay. Um, okay. I don't. Uh, I believe that was. Those were the the items that we needed to. To clarify, but um, why don't we take a, a short break, um, and then if we need to, we can come back. Okay. Okay. Officer Lundgren was yet another officer that did not arrive until Clark was down, but the investigators are more concerned with the number of times that he switched off his microphone. There was a concern that he could have been attempting to conceal evidence that night cast Robinette in a bad light. But it was later determined that he acted within the bounds of department protocol. The fourth officer to be interviewed is Officer Stephen Pitts. Hey, go ahead. My name is Terrence Pressman. This is my card. I've already given him one of my cards. Okay, perfect. Thank you. He has popcorn. I know. Uh, I have a tool recorder here, record for my own purposes here. And the recorder's on, and it's uh, 1618. All right, Stephen, just uh, for the record, I'm Todd Colt. There's my card. You can uh, get a hold of me anytime. Uh, uh, this is Terrence Brass. He just entered himself. He's from the uh, Department of Justice. Okay. Um, and just for the record, your name? Stephen Pitts. Stephen Pitts. And Mick? Boyd, B O I D. And make it with uh, SBOA? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, all right, Stephen, so uh, you just got an opportunity to watch uh, your body worn camera, kind of what we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, just get a little bit of background before then. Um, how long have you been a police officer? Uh, just under two years. Just under two years. Have all two years been here with the Sacramento Police Department? Yes. Um, do you have any prior military experience? No. Okay. Um, on um, March 18th of this year, uh, can you just kind of explain to me what uh, what you were doing uh, here at this? Um, I was at the hospital taking a report. Uh, while at the hospital, um, on the phone, I've been my sergeant about my, my report that I was currently taking when I heard uh, that this incident, the officer involved shooting, was going on. Uh, got in my car and started to drive code three towards. Uh, the location that it happened at. Okay. Um, 
as a hospital car, what are your normal hours? Oh, I'm not a hospital car. I was just at the hospital. Oh, you were just at the hospital? Correct. Uh, what shift were you working? Swings. Swings in what sector? Sector 5. Sector 5 swings? Okay. Um, and did you hear the uh, the call come out over the radio, or did you hear from your through sergeant the on the phone? Through the phone. My phone's off. Dude, you being inside the hospital. Being inside the hospital, you didn't, couldn't get radio signal. I got cut it off. Okay. So, and then uh, you heard through the phone. That, Correct. Uh, do you remember what time that was? Nine-ish. Nine-ish, okay. Yeah. Um, and then you respond code three to the incident, right? Correct. Okay, um, kind of walk me through once you get on scene, what, what goes on? Uh, once I get on scene, I'm not sure what the exact house is, I'm not sure where I'm needed, um, but air gets overhead, and I see there's a lot of people already kind of going in different directions on the scene, so I get there for scene security, and he says we need someone to block off uh, an area which was right next to me. So I uh, moved my vehicle into a position and tried to tape off the area. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so you get there, you block something off, and then uh, at some point uh, you mute your body worn camera. Do you recall muting it, or do you? I do recall uh, muting my camera. Uh, okay. Um, why did you mute it? Uh, I was on the perimeter basically at that point and I wasn't really doing a canvas or anything or talking to the public or uh, doing anything really to investigate besides securing the scene. Okay. Um, and I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, as you uh, respond to the uh, the incident, was your camera already on? Was it, uh, how did it come on? Do you remember? I believe my camera was already on due to me taking the report inside the hospital. So you're, you're doing whatever in the hospital, your camera is going, you hear that it's going, and then you respond. Okay. And your, your camera continues to move to record. Okay. Um, there's a point in time where uh, you contact Officer McMurkdahl. Correct. Um, how do you know Officer McMurkdahl? Uh, we work together, good friends, um, kind of classmates. Okay, so you guys are in the same academy, and he's, he's on your team currently? Okay. Um, do you guys work the same beat, or do you have different beats, or how does that work? I uh, we'll work the same beat. Same beat. So he's your beat partner. Correct. Okay. Um, now, when you walk up to Officer Markdahl, what uh, what do you guys talk about? I don't really recall if I talk to him. I think, do recall in my head trying to think what how can I could solve someone that's in a situation like this right now that's been involved in a shooting. Did you know he was involved in the shooting at the time? I heard over the radio the updates and stuff like that. So I assumed. You assumed, but you didn't have any direct knowledge that he, he was one of the shooters or involved in the shooting? Correct. Okay. Um, how long were you standing with uh, Officer Mercadol, would you say? I would estimate a couple minutes. A couple minutes. And then what'd you do after that? Uh, I was, I remember, recall having to keep my eye back and forth. Uh, because I had that perimeter I was in charge of, so um, basically I was just more of my focus was like I have a job to do, but also hey, it's my buddy right there, so mm -hmm. that's about it. Did uh, Officer Markdahl tell you any specifics on the shooting at that time? I don't believe we talked at all. Okay. So, um, Terrence, you got anything? You said you don't believe, you don't re believe, or you don't remember if you guys talked. At I don't all. recall talking at all, or don't okay. believe that we talked. Um, because after watching my video, there's no conversation that comes to mind. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Cool. Take a break. This tape recorder is going to be on, but I know you guys are not going to be yeah. there. Okay. Pitts was another officer who arrived late to the scene and turned off his microphone. It was determined that he did not know who was involved with the shooting, and the timing of turning off his microphone was also within the bounds of department protocol. Next to be interviewed was Officer Terrence Mercado, who was the other officer who fired at Clark. So we'll have a, a couple uh, questions and things like that. Um, Department issue firearm, the, the 40 caliber? Yes. And it's uh, March 19th at 0321. 
So the first thing I'm going to have you do is just go ahead and um, pop the magazine out of your gun. Perfect. And then um, go ahead and unholster and then using the clearing tube go ahead and uh, run to your firearm so uh, lock in the slide back. If you don't mind, uh, just grabbing the round. So again, the round that was just picked up was the one in the chamber, which is a federal um, Smith & Wesson 40 caliber. All right, the serial number on this is UU749. Nine six four. All right, again, so the magazine in the gun is a twelve round magazine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. Can you go ahead and just remove one of your magazines? Thank you. One, two, so I see that it's missing 10 rounds. Did you do a tactical, tactical reload? Perfect. So this would have been the gun that had been in your the magazine that had been in your gun. Yes. Perfect. And then if you can go ahead and do your next magazine. Perfect. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Um, any other uh, pistol magazines? No. Okay. Like you, rifle mag. That's fine. Yeah. Um, you did not access your rifle, correct? No. Do you carry a backup weapon? I do not. You do not. Okay. Uh, so at the beginning of your shift, what does the how many rounds do you carry in your your weapon itself? Uh, I normally carry one 12 round magazine with one in the chamber. So for a total of 13? Yes. Okay. So based on what we have here, um, would indicate you fired how many rounds? Uh, 10 rounds. 10 rounds. You want to come in and take just an overall picture? collect your gun mm -hmm. and um, all the magazines and we'll issue you a runner firearm. Okay? department issued 40 caliber um, handgun same round magazines and all that again we're just going to have that firearm long enough for it to be um, inspected by the county crime lab so if you want you can go ahead and start loading your gun we'll get you back fully loaded before we leave the room okay, okay. okay. so verify and we can um, get the, the tack light off that so you have okay. your, your light and all that with you. So if you want to go ahead and start loading up. Okay, thank you. She's 
Actually, before you uh, oh, sure. load it up, why don't you go oh, and get right back on? Thanks. So again, we'll have you guys go ahead and uh, step out and just go out to the atrium for a couple minutes. Thank you. Unlike Robinette, for this portion of the interview, the investigators were more focused on Mercado's weapon and ammunition, and if they would support his version of what happened that night. Later, they questioned Mercado more intently. Uh, and... Uh where were you when you heard the call? I was, uh, when I got dispatched to the call, I was leaving another uh, shot spotter call, which I believe was on Stone Valley Circle. So um, we were coming from that call. I don't want to say it was Stone Valley Circle is where we were responding from. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... Um, were, was the the information, was it um, a call that was sent to your NDT or was it broadcasted over the radio? The call initially was broadcasted over the radio. Um, it was kind of a code 12, which basically meant that there were no units available uh, to initially respond to the call. Um, oh, I apologize. Actually, I, I think they had cross-sectored somebody from Sector 4 to go take care of the call for service, which was a 921. Okay. Which is a um, car cloud or a car break in in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when they had broadcasted the call, um, do you re recall what what information was um, being transmitted? Yes. Um, the, per the text of the call, there was an active nine two one in progress. Apparently, a sus subject had been breaking car windows on 29th Street. Um, I don't recall the exact address where he was breaking car windows, but it, apparently this person had broken multiple car windows. He was confronted by the complainant or neighbors who chased him into a backyard on 29th Street, which they believed he was still hiding in one of those backyards. And they described a male black wearing a black hooded sweatshirt, dark pants, and they couldn't describe what tool or object he used to break the windows. Okay. And um, you had mentioned that uh, a unit from Sector 4 had gotten uh, cross-sector dispatched to that call? They had. Uh, they had initially gotten cross-sectored and um, Officer Robinette, one Charles 5-4, and myself decided to cancel them so they didn't have to come all the way across into Sector 5, and we decided we were going to go handle the call. 
Okay. And then what happened? Uh, we get dispatched to the call. Um, Officer Robinette was in front of me, driving in his uh, Crown Vic. I followed behind him. Um, we approached the scene. We pulled from. We pulled down, uh, heading west on Meadowview, and then we went north on 29th Street. Uh, and then we, I believe, he parked on the west side of the street. I parked on the east side of the street of where the, which is the residence was on the west side of the street of where the suspect had apparently been hiding in the backyard. Okay. Yeah. Do you recall the address? I do not recall the address. I know it's um, and then the numbers are blurred after that. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Do you remember um, the name of the street? It was 29th Street. Okay. Yes. Um, do you think if I were to show you a map, you'd be able to um, point out the, the residence where you responded to? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to show you um, a Google map. Uh, it's not to scale, okay, but this is a Google map of the, of the area. Um, so that's Meadowview there, mm -hmm. um, and then that's 29th there. All right. Okay. The residence was north of Elwood Avenue. Um, I believe it's going to be this one here with the shed. I remember specifically there's a shed in the corner that I ended up checking. Yeah, this one here. Okay. And what happened um, after that? So, as we're arriving on the scene, we had. Um, we were receiving updates from STAR, which is the Sheriff's Department's helicopter, giving us updates about him checking the area, looking for heat signatures, looking for the potential suspect. Um, from what STAR had broadcasted, that he had checked this yard, and he did not recognize any heat signatures that he observed to be human. He recognized that there were large canines in the backyard, Officer Robinette and I went and made contact with the resident, the homeowner, and advised her of what was going on and asked if uh, we could check her backyard to ensure that there were no suspects or anybody hiding back there who wasn't supposed to be there. She uh, allowed us access. She put her dogs into the uh, garage, and Officer Robinette and I went back there through the backyard, through the south end of the residence, through a side fence. We walked in. Uh, we made a tactical approach, tactically cleared the backyard. There was a shed that was in the uh, southwest corner of the residence of the backyard that we checked. We determined it was locked, and then we proceeded to leave out of the yard. Um, While we were at the front door talking to the resident, Star had broadcasted that he believed there was a suspicious vehicle that was in the area, possibly in this parking lot here um, in the, near the field that he felt could possibly contain somebody. Okay. And so our plan was, after we left the backyard, we were going to get in our patrol cars and drive around and check out that suspicious vehicle. Okay. Okay. And um, so what happened after you left um, the, the rear of the residence that you were checking? Uh, 
As we were leaving, we both began to approach our cars to go check on the suspicious vehicle. Starr had broadcasted that he sees a subject. He saw a subject in the backyard of a residence approximately two houses south of us. So Jared and I both came out out on the street and were trying to take a look and see what exactly what area he was referring to. I remember we both were slowly kind of walking and approaching, trying to determine, you know, what house he was talking about, see if we saw anybody on the street, really just trying to get our bearings. And Starr broadcasted that the suspect or the subject was, he gave us the address, was in the backyard. He said he saw the subject, looks like he was attempting to break into another car. He couldn't see what the subject was using to break into the car. He couldn't see what was in his hands. And he was giving us, kind of directing us exactly where to go. We began to make an approach. Starr advised the subject was running south and sounded like he was jumping fences. He said he looks like he's running south, jumping fences. So Robinette and I began running south on 29th Street, attempting to parallel him and potentially cut him off. As Starr began to give a description of the house that the subject was at, he said he was in the backyard. And then he began describing that there was a series or a set of cars that was along the north side of the residence that it looked like the subject was breaking into. I believe it might have been right here. So I approached the north end of this house, this residence, and then kind of looking down this driveway on the north end of the residence. It's very dark back there. There's a couple of vehicles kind of blocking my view. There was a dark colored SUV or Suburban that was all the way to the west. It was like the furthest one on the side of the house. And I saw a male black adult with a black hooded sweatshirt pulled up over his head, standing behind that vehicle. I gave him loud verbal commands to let me see his hands because I could not see where his hands were. After saying that, he turned around and began running westbound and then turned south into the backyard out of my line of sight. Okay. And then what happened? I alerted Officer Robinette that I spotted the subject back there, and I began to chase after him. I think I attempted to broadcast that he was running south. I don't know if it went out or not, but I attempted to say it. There was kind of a narrow path between the northern side of the house and the vehicles that were parked there. So I remember going in between the vehicles and the narrow edge of the house. Then there was a small wooden fence, about hip height, that had an opening kind of north of the residence. So I went around the car, went around the fence, and then started kind of going around the backyard. I had lost sight of the subject, so I kind of attempted to slow down, and I tried to pie around the corner, slowly, tactically go around the corner. When I come around the corner, the corner of the house, I left cover, and I look, and I see that same subject with his hooded sweatshirt pulled up and his arms pointed out, extended like this. At which time I looked, and based on the light coming off of my tactical light, it appeared, I thought, that he had already shot at me because I saw what I believed to be a metallic reflection or muzzle flash, something coming at me. So I was scared. I thought that he had shot at me. I think I remember yelling, gun. And I ducked back behind the corner of the house for cover. By this time, I realized Officer Robinette was there next to me on my left side. And 
for a second I thought my I, I had to kind of uh, get my bearings and like did I see what I thought I saw uh, and I poked my head back out around the corner way further than I, I should have put it out there and uh, I see that the subject is advancing towards us and I see that same bright metallic shining of the light in his hands and uh, I thought he had was approaching and shooting at us and so I remember ducking for cover uh, I, I ducked um, grabbed cover behind the corner of the house and then I remember kneeling down on my left knee and returning fire because um, I believe we were being fired upon um, and uh, I believe I fired well, ten times and uh we saw the subject go down, and uh, we began to give him, you know, kind of verbal commands for us to, you know, for him to show us his hands. Uh, he wasn't moving anymore, but we could only see his right hand. His left hand appeared to be kind of tucked in under his body. So. Okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> what happened after that? After that, we're broadcasting the updates, I, remember, I believe I had broadcasted there were shots fired and I said that the subject was down. Um, we were putting out pertinent information as to where we were, how to access us. I believe STAR was also directing units in the area to come come out. Uh, I do remember telling everybody that we're, that no officers were hit, we're okay, uh, advising the subject was down, we couldn't see his hands. Um, and then I remember uh, additional officers arrived on scene, I believe it was Officer Taylor and Officer Trujillo arrived on scene and uh, we kind of uh, set a, stayed behind cover, attempted to give the male more verbal commands uh, and then I believe that SAM 5, which was Sergeant Morris arrived and the decision was made to make a contact team to go apprehend the subject. Uh, we all made a tactical approach and um, I remember, you know, I think Sergeant Morris, and I'm not sure who else went hands-on. I remember taking out my handcuffs and placing my handcuffs on the subject, bringing them over, and uh, uh, then the decision was made to start doing CPR, life-saving measures. Okay. And do you recall who performed CPR? I believe Officer Taylor uh, began performing CPR. I went to put my gloves on, I went to go get a rescue mask, um, and then I remember that I was, I recall somebody else saying that they were going back there to take care of it, to get a rescue mask, uh, to begin to assist with CPR. And then walking outside, I see that the fire department and ambulance got there relatively, really quick, and then they went to the backyard to start their deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to uh, when you first arrived on scene. Okay. Um, when you first arrived on scene, did you did you locate any of the the vehicles that had possibly been vandalized? I had. Um, we actually spoke with um, one of the complainants on 29th Street. I believe he was on the east side of the street. He had contacted us and told us that he had chased the subject away. He had chased him into the backyard. He's pretty sure he was in that, uh, in this backyard that's on the west side. He pointed to the vehicles uh, that were kind of down here closer towards Elwood. I did recall seeing two vehicle windows smashed out and glass on the ground. I believe the driver's side windows of both vehicles had uh, their windows smashed and broken out and I could see the glass reflecting off the light in the street and um, you know I remember thinking like come up, having to come back and start taking the relevant information for a report on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I want to go <coughs> to um, after Star had given you um, an update about uh, the subject, seeing the subject in uh, a, a backyard just south of you. Mm -hmm. um, and you um, arriving to, to the residence where you saw the suspect. 
Um, what type of lighting was there in that area? Well, in that area, it was extremely dark. There was street lighting on 29th Street, but as you know, street lighting is kind of scattered around. So when we approached uh, this residence, the residence was dark. Um, didn't appear that anybody was awake at all. There were no lights on uh, at the house. There were no lights on the front porch, no lights in the backyard. And it was kind of in a shadowy area where there was no street lights illuminating anything. And uh, it, was, it was extremely dark back there. So I remember having to illuminate. Uh, I, had my, I did have my, my gun out just based on not knowing what's going on. Um, the information that I received from Star that he didn't know what kind of weapon the person had in his hands. Um, and I remember accessing the tack light on my weapon in order to kind of illuminate the area where I was looking. Okay. Um, did you um, also use your handheld flashlight? Uh, while I was walking on the street, yes, I did. I There was a point in time where I had holstered my gun and I brought my uh, flashlight out. My, well, I used my department issued the Pelican flashlight because it's pretty bright. And I had that in my left hand and I was kind of using that to... Um, shine light around so I can kind of see what was going on, see what, you know, Star was talking about. Um, apparently Star had given us information that the person was running towards the front of the house and I was like, well, I don't see anybody. I don't know what he's talking about. So, okay. No. And so, um, I want to go back to when you're um, standing um, at the residence where you see the suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned that you had uh, said something to him. What what was it that you had meant, said to him? I had given him verbal commands to show me his hands. Okay. Uh, did you give him any other commands? Uh, I remember once he began running, I remember yelling, stop. Um, and then, let me see your hands, I believe was another phrase I used. Okay. Um, did you ever identify yourself as a police officer? Shots fired, so take down. Mm, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I had, if I did. Okay. Um, and then once you were in the backyard, um, can you describe for me the lighting in the backyard? There was no lighting in the backyard, no rear porch, no back porch light, no uh, lighting of any kind from the neighboring residences. Um, all I recall, it was pitch black in the backyard there, and the only light that uh, I was able to use was my tack light on my firearm, and then also in the background I could see Star going around with its, his overhead light, but his light was in a different area. It wasn't in the backyard where we were. Okay. Yeah. And can you... Um can you demonstrate for me mm -hmm. uh, the position that you saw the suspect in once you came around the corner? Uh, yeah, sure. He was. Um, you can stand up if oh, you have to, okay. or you can. Yeah. All right. So he was. So as I got to the corner, mm -hmm. um, kind of the direction that you were in, I recall that he was kind of sucked up close to the uh, east side of the building, or he was closer to the side of the building um, and I think there was some kind of table or bench to the left side like a wooden picnic bench or something and I remember seeing him standing like this when I first come around the corner he's standing like this and that's at the time I thought I saw a um, muzzle flash I was scared I was like oh my god this is shooting at me um, second time I come back around 
he had advanced and moved up. He wasn't in that same position he was in. It looked like he was moving forward like this. Okay. So that's when I took cover and returned fire. Okay. And so the first time you saw him with his arms extended, what was going on in your mind? What were you thinking? First thing I thought, I was like, wow, that was stupid of me to come around the corner that fast. And I remember thinking, I was like, this guy's freaking shooting at me. I was like, is that a gun? He's shooting at me. And it was kind of surreal. It was almost like slow motion. And I was like, this dude's freaking shooting at me. I was like, he's really shooting at me. And so I remember, you know, get out of the way, dummy. That was my first instinct. And kind of ducking around. And then Jerry had kind of taken a way better position than me and had kind of kept himself on the corner. And then he ducked back. And I remember him ducking forward again at the same time I ducked forward to kind of reaffirm what we saw. And then, again, that's when I noticed the huge gap that the subject had made. You know, he had moved, I don't know, maybe possibly 10 feet or more up towards us. And I remember ducking back behind cover like, oh, shoot, you know, he's shooting right now. He's approaching. And I thought he was shooting at us. So, I don't know, something kicked in. I just, I knew that Jared was standing up at the corner. And obviously I was going to stand right next to him. So I just kneeled down beside him and kind of came out to the side and returned fire from cover. Okay. Are you injured at all? I got some cut or scrape on my forearm here. I don't know where it came from. Maybe from running by the fence or something or the wall. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But other than that, that's it. Okay. And then when you were firing, what were you aiming at? I was aiming at the subject. I remember he was close to the residence. He was just on the east side of the house. And then he started to move out west, away from the house, towards the fence line. And I remember kind of trailing him as he started to move that direction. And then he finally went down. Okay. Can you tell me what the background looked like? The background was extremely dark. There was, south of that residence, there was a house. And you could see, obviously, the wooden fence line there and the residence there. But the fence line to the west, you could see through the gaps in the fence that it opened up into an open field. Other than that, the grass was extremely tall. He was under an awning, like an overhang awning, which is directly protruded out from the house, probably seven, eight feet or something like that. So he was at the awning. I just remember seeing how tall the grass was. The grass, the backyard was really unkempt. Okay. And then did you intend to shoot the subject? Yes, I did. Okay. And why? I was in fear for my life. I thought he was already shooting at me. So I wanted to return fire to stop the threat. Okay. And going back to your body-worn camera, were you wearing it at the time? Yes, I was. Okay. And was it turned on and recording? It was. It was activated and recording. Okay. Have you attended CPT yet this year? Yes, I have. Okay. What about last year CIT training? Yes, I did. Okay. Are you 11-550 trained? Yes, yes. Okay. Did this subject exhibit any symptoms that 
um, you could have perceived as um, possibly uh, the subject suffering from um, mental health issues? I was unable to determine any of that. It was extremely dark. Um, when I initially gave him a command to show, show me his hands, he attempted to run and flee from me. Um, I never heard him say a word or anything, nor did I even get a good uh, look at his face to see you know, his mental status or if he's under the influence or anything. Everything moved really fast. Okay. Um. I want to go back to um, to when you and Officer Robinette were in the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, when when the subject was down on the ground, uh, what were was there um, any type of conversation uh, between you and um, Officer Robinette pertaining to um, after force care? Um, after the subject was detained, we did talk about uh, medical aid. But when it was just Officer Robinette and I, yes. when it was just Officer Robinette and I, we stayed behind cover uh, directly after the firing. I remember after we put out our permanent radio traffic, um, Officer Robinette uh, advised me that he would cover downrange for me. Well, I performed a tactical reload, which I did. I performed a tactical reload to make sure I had adequate ammunition in case uh, the gunfight continued. I then took Officer Robinette's position so he could perform a tactical reload. And we were waiting for additional units to arrive on scene. Uh, I don't recall Officer Robinette and I talking about uh, aftercare for him at that time until after we had formed a contact team to talk about getting help. Um, I remember saying to the subject that we wanted to, you know, make sure that he was okay or try and give him some help, but he had to let us know what was going on with him. So. Okay. And did he respond to any of those questions? He did not. Okay. Um, <coughs> do you have any um, missing um, gear or equipment uh, particularly a, a cell phone that might have been left behind? No, I did not. Okay. Um, I think this is a, a good time to take a break. Okay? Sure. So. for this 921 for this, this car cloud car burglary um, and STAR is giving you several updates. Yes. Um, at any point did STAR give you an update indicating that um, the subject's be behavior had changed? Yes. Um, from initially, and this is all in a matter of uh, less than a minute, we're getting these updates. Star had advised that he spotted the subject in a backyard, um, two houses south of us, which is the primary residence we were at. We checked, that backyard was clear. He said two houses south of us. Um, as we began to kind of jog up to where he was talking about, he, I heard the update from Star that the subjects started running, so his behavior had changed. He started running south, and so we're thinking, you know, he's running from yard to yard, he's going in different directions. Um, I remember there was a point when Star had advised that the subject was attempting to break into another car. Um, and there was something in his hands, you couldn't see what was in his hands. I remember that pretty clearly because I was like, all right, well, what's, what does he have? You know, is it a lead pipe? Is it a, 
you know, with the gun? Is it like, what is he breaking car windows with? You know, it's, maybe it's a, I don't know what he's, what he's breaking car windows with. So I remember hearing that behavior and then uh, Star advised he's trying to get into another car and that's when um, Star gave the direction of what house he was at. Um, on the north side of the house there's some cars that were in the uh, kind of driveway, alleyway you know, leading up to the north side of the house. Uh, and I remember looking and then looking deep uh, back into the backyard west and seeing him behind a car, um, just the top half of his body. Um, and then from there, that was that was as far as the behavior changes I saw. And then he takes off running. So okay. Um, <clears throat> prior to Star broadcasting that the subject was running south. Mm -hmm. Had Star um, mentioned uh, what the suspect may have been doing in the backyard? I believe Star had said the subject was, he had, was, he said he's got a subject, he said I've got somebody in the backyard, um, said he looks like he was looking around or snooping around, um, that's kind of all I really remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, when you first arrived on scene, mm -hmm. do you remember um, the update that Star had given you? Yeah, I remember Star had given the update that he initially had checked the area, he had initially checked the house that we were in the primary call for service that we were at at that residence, and he didn't see any heat signatures there. Um, and he began kind of having a, a wider circling pattern. I remember seeing that. And he was looking for, you know, anybody hiding in backyards. And uh, initially he didn't see anything. He broadcasted, he saw that suspicious vehicle in the field to the west. Uh, that might be worth taking a look at. And uh, those were kind of the updates we heard until after we cleared that yard and we come back out and tell him, hey, we're going to go look at that car. Uh, that's when Star said, hey, I actually have somebody, you know, in the backyard, two houses down from you, south of you, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you recall <coughs> if at any point Star had broadcasted uh, that the subject had uh, broken a window at a residence? I recall that Star had said the subject had broken a window. I don't know if it was at a residence. I believe he had said at a car, a oh, car. Okay. I thought. Okay. Um, well, I think this concludes um, the interview. Do you have anything to add? I have no questions. No questions? Okay. I'm okay. good. Good? Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Robinette and McConnell were immediately placed on administrative leave while the internal investigation took place. The shooting sparked public outcry and protests across the city of Sacramento. After the investigation, it was decided that Robinette and McConnell would not be prosecuted and that the officers had probable cause to stop and detain Clark and that they were legally justified in using deadly force against him. Clark's underage sons sued the city for $20 million. The city settled the lawsuit for $2.4 million. Each boy will receive $900,000 when he reaches the age of 22. If you enjoyed this video and want to support me further, there's a Patreon link in the description where you can do just that. Thank you for watching. Stay safe.